Chapter Six, Part One of the Eventful History of the Mutiny and Piratical Seizure of H.M.S. Bounty, Its Cause and Consequences. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brett Downey. The Eventful History of the Mutiny and Piratical Seizure of H.M.S. Bounty by Sir John Barrow. Chapter Six, Part One. The Court Martial. If any person in or belonging to the fleet shall make or endeavour to make any mutinous assembly upon any pretence whatsoever, every person offending herein and being convicted thereof by the sentence of the court martial shall suffer death. Naval Articles of War, Article Nineteen. The court assembled to try the prisoners on board His Majesty's ship Duke on the 12th September, 1792, and continued by adjournment from day to day, Sunday excepted, until the 18th of the same month. Footnote 24. Present. Vice Admiral Lord Hood, President. Captain Sir Andrew Snape Hammond, Baronet. Captain John Colpoise. Captain Sir George Montague. Captain Sir Roger Curtis. Captain John Baisley, Captain Sir Andrew Snape Douglas, Captain John Thomas Duckworth, Captain John Nicholson Inglefield, Captain John Knight, Captain Albemarle Bertie, Captain Richard Goodwin Keats. The charge is set forth that Fletcher Christian, who was mate of the bounty, assisted by others of the inferior officers and men, armed with muskets and bayonets, had violently and forcibly taken that ship from her commander, Lieutenant Bly, and that he, together with the master, boatswain, gunner, and carpenter, and other persons, being nineteen in number, were forced into the launch and cast adrift. That Captain Edwards, in the Pandora, was directed to proceed to Otaheite, and other islands in the South Seas, and to use his best endeavours to recover the said vessel and to bring in confinement to england the said fletcher christian and his associates or as many of them as he might be able to apprehend in order that they might be brought to condign punishment etc that peter haywood james morrison charles norman joseph coleman thomas ellison thomas mackintosh thomas burkett john millward william musprat and michael byrne had been brought to england etc and were now put on their trial Mr. Fryer, the master of the bounty, being first sworn, deposed. That he had the first watch, that between ten and eleven o'clock Mr. Bly came on deck, according to custom, and after a short conversation, and having given his orders for the night, left the deck. That at twelve he was relieved by the gunner, and retired, leaving all quiet. That at dawn of day he was greatly alarmed by an unusual noise, and that, on attempting to jump up, John Sumner and Matthew Quintal laid their hands upon his breast and desired him to lie still, saying he was their prisoner, that on expostulating with them he was told, Hold your tongue, or you are a dead man, but if you remain quiet there is none aboard will hurt a hair of your head. He further deposes, that on raising himself on the locker, he saw on the ladder, going upon deck, Mr. Bly in his shirt, with his hands tied behind him, and Christian holding him by the cord that the master-at-arms, Churchill, then came to his cabin and took a brace of pistols and a hanger, saying, I will take care of these, Mr. Fryer. That he asked, on seeing Mr. Bly bound, what they were going to do with the captain. That Sumner replied, Damn his eyes! Put him into the boat and let him see if he can live upon three-fourths of a pound of yams a day. That he remonstrated with such conduct, but in vain. They said he must go in the small cutter, the small cutter mr fryer exclaimed why her bottom is almost out and very much eaten by the worms to which sumner and quintal both said damn his eyes the boat is too good for him then after much entreaty he prevailed upon them to ask christian if he might be allowed to go on deck which after some hesitation was granted when i came on deck says mr fryer mr bligh was standing by the mizzenmast with his hands tied behind him and christian holding the cord with one hand and a bayonet in the other. I said, Christian, consider what you are about. Hold your tongue, sir, he said. I have been in hell for weeks past. 
Captain Bly has brought all this on himself. I told him that Mr. Bly and he not agreeing was no reason for taking the ship. Hold your tongue, sir, he said. I said, Mr. Christian, you and I have been on friendly terms during the voyage. Therefore, give me leave to speak. Let Mr. Bly go down to his cabin, and I make no doubt we shall all be friends again. He then repeated, Hold your tongue, sir. It is too late. And threatening me if I said anything more. Mr. Fryer then asked him to give a better boat than the cutter. He said, No, that boat is good enough. Bly now said to the master that the man behind the hen coops, Isaac Martin, was his friend, and desired him, the master, to knock Christian down, which Christian must have heard, but took no notice. That Friar then attempted to get past Christian to speak to Martin, but he put his bayonet to his breast, saying, Sir, if you advance an inch farther, I will run you through, and ordered two armed men to take him down to his cabin. Shortly afterwards, he was desired to go on deck. When Christian ordered him into the boat, he said, I will stay with you if you will give me leave. No, sir, he replied, go directly into the boat. Bly, then on the gangway, said, Mr. Fryer, stay in the ship. No, by God, sir, Christian said, go into the boat, or I will run you through. Mr. Fryer states that during this time very bad language was used by the people towards Mr. Bly, that with great difficulty they prevailed on Christian to suffer a few articles to be put into the boat that after the persons were ordered into the boat to the number of nineteen such opprobrious language continued to be used several of the men calling out shoot the blank that cole the boatswain advised they should cast off and take their chance as the mutineers would certainly do them a mischief if they stayed much longer mr fryer then states the names of those who were under arms and that joseph coleman thomas mcintosh charles norman and michael byrne prisoners wished to come into the boat, declaring they had nothing to do in the business, that he did not perceive Mr. Peter Haywood on deck at the seizure of the ship. On being asked what he supposed Christian meant when he said he had been in hell for a fortnight, he said, from the frequent quarrels that they had, and the abuse he had received from Mr. Bly, and that the day before the mutiny Mr. Bly had challenged all the young gentlemen and people with stealing his coconuts. Mr. Cole, the boatswain, deposes that he had the middle watch, was awakened out of his sleep in the morning, and heard a man calling out to the carpenter, that they had mutinied and taken the ship, that Christian had the command, and that the captain was a prisoner on the quarter-deck, that he went up the hatchway, having seen Mr. Haywood and Mr. Young in the opposite berth, that coming on deck he saw the captain with his hands tied behind him, and four sentinels standing over him, two of which were Ellison and Burkett, the prisoners that he asked Mr. Christian what he meant to do, and was answered by his ordering him to hoist the boat out, and shook the bayonet, threatening him and damning him if he did not take care, that when he found the captain was to be sent out of the ship, he again went aft with the carpenter to ask for the longboat, that they asked three or four times before he granted it, that he saw Mr. Peter Haywood, one of the prisoners, lending a hand to get the four stayfall along, and when the boat was hooked on, spoke something to him, but what it was does not know, as Christian was threatening him at the time. That Haywood then went below, and does not remember seeing him afterwards. That after the few things were got into the boat, and most of the people in her, they were trying for the carpenter's tool chest, when Quintile said, Damn them! If we let them have these things, they will build a vessel in a month. But when all were in the boat, she was veered astern, when Coleman, Norman, and Mackintosh, prisoners, were crying at the gangway, wishing to go in the boat, and Byrne in the cutter alongside was also crying, that he advised Mr. Bly to cast off, as he feared they would fire into the boat. The court asked if he had any reason to believe that any other of the prisoners than those named were detained contrary to their inclinations. Answer. I believe Mr. Haywood was. I thought all along he was intending to come away. He had no arms, and he assisted to get the boat out, and then went below. I heard Churchill call out, Keep them below! The court. Do you think he meant Haywood? I have no reason to think any other. Mr. Peckover, the gunner's evidence, is similar to that of Mr. Cole's, and need not be detailed. Mr. Purcell, the carpenter, corroborated, generally, the testimony of the three who had been examined. The court asked, Did you see Mr. Haywood standing upon the booms? 
yes he was leaning the flat part of his hand on a cutlass when i exclaimed in the name of god peter what do you do with that when he instantly dropped it and assisted in hoisting the launch out and handing the things into the boat and then went down below when i heard churchill call to thompson to keep them below but could not tell whom he meant i did not see mr haywood after that the court in what light did you look upon mr haywood at the time you say he dropped the cutlass on your speaking to him witness i looked upon him as a person confused and that he did not know he had a weapon in his hand or his hand being on it for it was not in his hand i considered him to be confused by his instantly dropping it and assisting in hoisting the boat out which convinced me in my own mind that he had no hand in the conspiracy that after this he went below as i think on his own account in order to collect some of his things to put into the boat the court do you upon the solemn oath you have taken believe that mr haywood by being armed with a cutlass at the time you have mentioned by anything that you could collect from his gestures or speeches had any intention of opposing or joining others that might oppose to stop the progress of the mutiny witness no the court in the time that mr haywood was assisting you to get the things into the boat did he in any degree whatsoever manifest a disposition to assist in the mutiny witness no the court was he during that time deliberate or frightened and in what manner did he behave himself witness i had not an opportunity of observing his every action being myself at that time engaged in getting several things into the boat so that i cannot tell the court putting every circumstance together declare to this court upon the oath you have taken how you considered his behavior whether as a person joined in the mutiny or as a person wishing well to captain bly witness i by no means considered him as a person concerned in the mutiny or conspiracy lieutenant thomas hayward late third lieutenant of the pandora and formerly midshipman of the bounty deposes that he had the morning watch that at four o'clock fletcher christian relieved the watch as usual that at five he ordered him as master's mate of his watch to look out while he went down to lash his hammock up that while looking at a shark astern of the ship to his unutterable surprise he saw fletcher christian charles churchill thomas burkett the prisoner john sumner matthew quintal william mccoy isaac martin henry hillbrandt and alexander smith coming aft armed with muskets and bayonets that on going forward he asked christian the cause of such an act who told him to hold his tongue instantly and leaving isaac martin as a sentinel on deck he proceeded with the rest of his party below to lieutenant bligh's cabin that the people on deck were mr john hallett myself robert lamb butcher thomas ellison prisoner at the helm and john mills at the con that he asked mills if he knew anything of the matter who pleaded total ignorance and thomas ellison quitted the helm and armed himself with a bayonet that the decks now became thronged with armed men that peter haywood james morrison two of the prisoners and george stewart were unarmed on the booms that fletcher christian and his gang had not been down long before he heard the cry of murder from lieutenant bligh and churchill calling out for a rope on which mills contrary to all orders and entreaties cut the deep sea line and carried a piece of it to their assistance but soon after lieutenant bligh was brought upon the quarter-deck with his hands bound behind him and was surrounded by most of those who came last on deck this witness then states that on the arrival of the pandora at metavay bay joseph coleman was the first that came on board that he was upset in a canoe and assisted by the natives that as soon as the ship was at anchor george stewart and peter haywood came on board that they made themselves known to captain edwards and expressed their happiness that he was arrived that he asked them how they came to go away with his majesty's ship the bounty when george stewart said when called upon hereafter he would answer all particulars that he was prevented by captain edwards from answering further questions and they were sent out of the cabin to be confined he then describes the manner in which the rest of the mutineers were taken on the island having stated that when he went below to get some things he saw peter haywood in his berth and told him to go into the boat he was asked by the court if haywood was prevented by any force from going upon deck 
he answered no the court did you from his behavior consider him as a person attached to his duty or to the party of mutineers witness i should rather suppose after my having told him to go into the boat and he not joining us to be on the side of the mutineers but that must be understood only as an opinion as he was not in the least employed during the active part of it the court did you observe any marks of joy or sorrow on his countenance or behavior witness sorrow lieutenant hallett late midshipman of the bounty states that he had the morning watch that he heard lieutenant Bly call out murder and presently after saw him brought upon the deck naked excepting his shirt with his hands tied behind him and christian holding the end of the cord which tied them in one hand and either a bayonet or a cutlass in the other that the cutter was hoisted out and mr samuel mr hayward and myself ordered to go into her but the boatswain and carpenter going aft and telling christian they wished to go with the captain rather than stay in the ship and asking to have the launch it was granted on being asked if he saw peter hayward on that day he replied once on the platform standing still and looking attentively towards captain bligh never saw him under arms nor spoke to him does not know if he offered to go into the boat nor did he hear any one propose to him to go into the boat that when standing on the platform captain bligh said something to him but what he did not hear upon which Haywood laughed turned round and walked away captain edwards being then called and sworn was desired by the court to state the conversation that passed between him and coleman peter Haywood, and george stewart when they came on board the pandora edwards joseph coleman attempted to come on board before the ship came to an anchor at otaheite he was soon afterwards taken up by canoes and came on board before the ship came to an anchor i began to make inquiries of him after the bounty and her people the next who came on board were stuart and peter Haywood. they came after the ship was at anchor but before any boat was on shore i did not see them come alongside i desired lieutenant larkin to bring them down to the cabin i asked them what news peter Haywood, i think said he supposed i had heard of the affair of the bounty i don't recollect all the conversation that passed between us he sometimes interrupted me by asking for mr Haywood, the lieutenant of the pandora whether he was on board or not he had heard that he was at last i acknowledged that he was and i desired him to come out of my stateroom where i had desired him to go into as he happened to be with me at the time lieutenant Haywood treated him with a sort of contemptuous look and began to enter into conversation with him respecting the bounty but i called the sentinel in to take them into custody and ordered lieutenant Haywood to desist and i ordered them to be put into irons some words passed and peter Haywood said he should be able to vindicate his conduct lieutenant corner of the pandora merely states his being sent to bring the rest of the mutineers on board who were at some distance from matave bay the prisoners being called on for their defence the witnesses were again separately called and examined on the part of the prisoners mr fryer the master called in and examined by mr Haywood. If you had been permitted, would you have stayed in the ship in preference to going into the boat? Witness. Yes. Prisoner. Had you stayed in the ship in expectation of retaking her, was my conduct such, from the first moment you knew me to this, as would have induced you to entrust me with your design? And do you believe I would have favoured it, and given you all the assistance in my power? Witness. I believe he would. I should not have hesitated a moment in asking of him, when i had an opportunity of opening my mind to him same question being put to mr cole the boatswain mr peckover the gunner and mr purcell the carpenter they all answered in the affirmative mr Haywood asked what was my general conduct temper and disposition on board the ship witness beloved by everybody to the best of my recollection to the same question mr cole answers always a very good character mr peckover the most amiable and deserving of everyone's esteem. Mr. Purcell, in every respect becoming the character of a gentleman, and such as merited the esteem of everybody. Mr. Cole, being examined, gave his testimony, that he never saw Mr. Haywood armed, that he did not consider him of the mutineer's party, that he saw nothing of levity or apparent merriment in his conduct, that when he was below with Stuart, he heard Churchill call out, Keep them below! and that he believes Haywood was one of the persons meant. 
has no doubt of it at all that bligh could not have spoken to him when on the booms loud enough to be heard that hayward was alarmed and hallett alarmed that he by no means considers hayward or morrison as mutineers mr purcell being examined states that respecting the cutlass on which he saw mr hayward's hand resting he does not consider him as being an armed man that he never thought of him as of the mutineers party that he never heard captain bligh speak to him that he thinks from his situation he could not have heard him that he was by no means guilty of levity or apparent merriment that he heard the master at arms call out to keep them below that mr hallett appeared to him to be very much confused and that mr hayward likewise appeared to be very much confused the court asked as you say you did not look upon the prisoner as a person armed to what did you allude when you exclaimed good god peter what do you do with that witness i look upon it as an accidental thing captain edwards being asked by hayward did i surrender myself to you upon the arrival of the pandora at otaheite witness not to me to the lieutenant i apprehend he put himself in my power i always understood he came voluntarily our boats were not in the water prisoner did i give you such information respecting myself and the bounty as afterwards proved true witness he gave me some information respecting the people on the island that corroborated with coleman's i do not recollect the particular conversation but in general it agreed with the account given by coleman prisoner when i told you that i went away the first time from otaheite with the pirates did i not at the same time inform you that it was not possible for me to separate myself from christian who would not permit any man of the party to leave him at that time lest by giving intelligence they might have been discovered whenever a ship should arrive witness yes but i do not recollect the latter part of it respecting giving intelligence mr fryer again called in and examined by mr morrison mr fryer states he saw him assist in hoisting out the boats that he said to him fryer go down below the court asked whether it might not have been from a laudable motive as supposing your assistance at that time might have prevented a more advantageous effort witness probably it might had i stayed in the ship he would have been one of the first that i should have opened my mind to from his good behavior in the former part of the voyage states his belief that he addressed him as advice and that in hoisting out the boat he was assisting captain bligh mr cole the boatswain states that he ordered morrison to go and help them with the cutter that he told them the boat was overloaded that captain bligh had begged that no more people should go in her and said he would take his chance in the ship that he shook morrison by the hand and said he would do him justice in england that he had no reason to suppose him concerned in the mutiny lieutenant thomas hayward states that morrison appeared joyful and supposed him to be one of the mutineers on being asked by morrison if he could declare before god and the court that what he stated was not the result of private pique witness not the result of any private pique but an opinion formed after quitting the ship from his not coming with us there being more boats than one cannot say they might have had the cutter this witness was pleased to remember nothing that was in favor of the prisoner lieutenant hallett states he saw morrison under arms being asked in what part of the ship he says i did not see him under arms till the boat was veered astern and he was then looking over the taffrail and called out in a jeering manner if my friends inquire after me tell them i am somewhere in the south seas captain edwards bore testimony that morrison voluntarily surrendered himself mr fryer did not see morrison armed he was in his watch and he considered him a steady sober attentive good man and acknowledged that if he had remained in the ship with the view of retaking her morrison would have been one of the first he should have called to his assistance mr cole gave testimony to his being a man of good character attentive to his duty and he never knew any harm of him mr purcell bore witness to his good character being always diligent and attentive did not see him under arms on the taffrail never heard him use any jeering speeches respecting the prisoner musbrat mr cole's evidence proves that he had a musket in his hands but not till the latter part of the business it is also proved that he assisted in getting things into the launch mr peckover saw him standing on the forecastle doing nothing he was not armed lieutenant hayward saw musprat among the armed men was asked when captain bligh used the words 
don't let the boat be overloaded my lads i'll do you justice do you understand the latter words my lads i'll do you justice to apply to clothes or to men whom he apprehended might go into the boat witness if captain bligh made use of the words my lads it was to the people already in the boat and not to those in the ship the court to whom do you imagine captain bligh alluded was it in your opinion to the men in the boat with him or to any persons then remaining in the ship witness to persons remaining in the ship end of chapter six part one recording by brett downey six part two of the eventful history of the mutiny and piratical seizure of h m s bounty its cause and consequences this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by brett downey the eventful history of the mutiny and piratical seizure of h m s bounty by sir john barrow chapter six part two against the prisoners ellison burkett and millward the evidence given by all the witnesses so clearly and distinctly proved they were under arms the whole time and actively employed against bly that it is unnecessary to go into any detail as far as they are concerned the court having called on the prisoners each separately for his defence mr hayward delivered his as follows my lords and gentlemen of this honourable court your attention has already been sufficiently exercised in the painful narrative of this trial. It is therefore my duty to trespass further on it as little as possible. The crime of mutiny, for which I am now arraigned, is so seriously pregnant with every danger and mischief that it makes the person so accused, in the eyes, not only of military men of every description, but of every nation, peer at once the object of unpardonable guilt and exemplary vengeance in such a character it is my misfortune to appear before this tribunal and no doubt i must have been gazed at with all that horror and indignation which the conspirators of such a mutiny as that in captain bligh's ship so immediately provoke hard then indeed is my fate that circumstances should so occur to point me out as one of them appearances probably are against me but they are appearances only for unless I may be deemed guilty for feeling a repugnance at embracing death unnecessarily, I declare before this court and the tribunal of Almighty God I am innocent of the charge. I chose rather to defer asking any questions of the witnesses until I heard the whole of the evidence, as the charge itself, although I knew it generally, was not in its full extent, nor in particular points made known to me before I heard it read by the judge advocate at the beginning of the trial and i feel myself relieved by having adopted such a mode as it enables me to set right a few particulars of a narrative which i had the honour to transmit to the earl of chatham containing an account of all that passed on the fatal morning of the twenty eighth of april seventeen eighty nine but which from the confusion the ship was in during the mutiny i might have mistaken or from the errors of an imperfect recollection i might have misstated the difference, however, will now be open to correction, and I have great satisfaction in observing that the mistakes but very slightly respect my part of the transaction, and I shall consequently escape the imputation of endeavouring to save myself by imposing on my judges. When first this sad event took place, I was sleeping in my hammock, nor, till the very moment of being awakened from it, had I the least intimation of what was going on. The spectacle was as sudden to my eyes as it was unknown to my heart, and both were convulsed at the scene. Matthew Thompson was the first that claimed my attention upon waking. He was sitting as a sentinel over the arm-chest and my berth, and informed me that the captain was a prisoner, and Christian had taken the command of the ship. I entreated for permission to go upon deck, and soon after the boatswain and the carpenter had seen me in my berth as they were going up from the fore hatchway. I followed them, as is stated in their evidence it is not in my power to describe my feelings upon seeing the captain as i did who with his hands tied behind him was standing on the quarter-deck a little abaft the mizzenmast and christian by his side my faculties were benumbed and i did not recover the power of recollection until called to by somebody to take hold of the tackle-fall 
and assist to get out the launch which i found was to be given to the captain instead of the large cutter already in the water alongside the ship it were in vain to say what things i put into the boat but many were handed in by me and in doing this it was that my hand touched the cutlass for i will not attempt to deny what the carpenter has deposed though on my conscience i am persuaded it was of momentary duration and innocent as to intention the former is evident from its being unobserved by every witness who saw me upon deck some of whom must have noticed it had it continued a single minute and the latter is proved by the only person who took notice of the circumstance and has also deposed that at the moment he beheld me i was apparently in a state of absolute stupor the poison therefore carries with it its antidote and it seems needless to make any further comment on the subject for no man can be weak enough to suppose that if i had been armed for the purpose of assisting in the mutiny i should have resumed a weapon in the moment of triumph and when the ship was so completely in the possession of the party that as more than one witness has emphatically expressed it all attempts at recovering her would have been impracticable the boat and ship it is true presented themselves to me without its once occurring that i was at liberty to choose much less that the choice i should make would be afterwards deemed criminal and i bitterly deplore that my extreme youth and inexperience concurred in torturing me with apprehensions and prevented me from preferring the former for as things have turned out it would have saved me from the disgrace of appearing before you as i do at this day it would have spared the sharp conflicts of my own mind ever since and the agonizing tears of a tender mother and my much beloved sisters add to my youth and inexperience that i was influenced in my conduct by the example of my messmates mr hallett and mr hayward the former of whom was very much agitated and the latter though he had been many years at sea yet when christian ordered him into the boat he was evidently alarmed at the perilous situation and so much overcome by the harsh command that he actually shed tears my own apprehensions were far from being lessened at such a circumstance as this and i fearfully beheld the preparations for the captain's departure as the preliminaries of inevitable destruction which although i did not think could be more certain yet i feared would be more speedy by the least addition to their number to show that i have no disposition to impose upon this court by endeavouring to paint the situation of the boat to be worse than it really was i need only refer to the captain's own narrative wherein he says that she would have sunk with them on the evening of the third may had it not been for his timely caution of throwing out some of the stores and all the clothes belonging to the people excepting two suits for each now what clothes or stores could they have spared which in weight would have been equal to that of two men for if i had been in her and the poor fellow norton had not been murdered at tafua she would have been encumbered with our additional weight and if it be true that she was saved by those means which the captain says she was it must follow that if norton and myself had been in her to say nothing of coleman mackintosh norman and byrne who tis confessed were desirous of leaving the ship she must either have gone down with us or to prevent it we must have lightened her of the provisions and other necessary articles and thereby have perished for want dreadful alternative a choice of deaths to those who are certain of dying may be a matter of indifference but where on one hand death appears inevitable and the means of salvation present themselves on the other however imprudent it might be to resort to those means in any other less trying situation i think and hope even at my present time of life that i shall not be suspected of a want of courage for saying few men would hesitate to embrace the latter such then was exactly my situation on board the bounty to be starved to death or drowned appeared to be inevitable if i went in the boat and surely it is not to be wondered at if at the age of sixteen years with no one to advise with and so ignorant of the discipline of the service having never been at sea before as not to know or even suppose it was possible that what i should determine upon might afterwards be alleged against me as a crime i say under such circumstances in so trying a situation can it be wondered at if i suffered the preservation of my life to be the first and to supersede every other consideration besides through the medium of the master the captain had directed the rest of the officers to remain on board in hopes of retaking the ship such is the master's assertion and such the report on board 
and as it accorded with my own wishes for the preservation of my life i felt myself doubly justified in staying on board not only as it appeared to be safer than going in the boat but from a consideration also of being in the way to be useful in assisting to accomplish so desirable a wish of the captain let it not for god's sake let it not be argued that my fears were groundless and that the arrival of the boat at timor is a proof that my conduct was wrong this would be judging from the event and i think i have plainly shown that but for the death of norton at defoa and the prudent order of the captain not to overload the boat neither himself nor any of the people who were saved with him would at this moment have been alive to have preferred any charge against me or given evidence at this trial if deliberate guilt be necessarily affixed to all who continued on board the ship and that in consequence they must be numbered with christian's party in such a strict view of matters it must irrevocably impeach the armourer and two carpenter's mates as well as martin and byrne who certainly wished to quit the ship and if christian's first intention of sending away the captain with a few persons only in the small cutter had not been given up or if even the large cutter had not been exchanged for the launch more than half of those who did go with him would have been obliged to stay with me forgetful for a moment of my own misfortunes i cannot help being agitated at the bare thought of their narrow escape everybody must and i am sure that this court will allow that my case is a peculiarly hard one inasmuch as the running away with the ship is a proof of the mutiny having been committed the innocent and the guilty are upon exactly the same footing had the former been confined by sickness without a leg to stand on or an arm to assist them in opposing the mutineers they must have been put upon their trial and instead of the captain being obliged to prove their guilt it would have been incumbent upon them to have proved themselves innocent how can this be done but negatively if all who wished it could not accompany the captain they were necessarily compelled to stay with christian and being with him were dependent on him subject to his orders however disinclined to obey them for force in such a state is paramount to everything but when on the contrary instead of being in arm or obeying any orders of the mutineers i did everything in my power to assist the captain and those who went with him and by all my actions except in neglecting to do what if i had done must have endangered the lives of those who were so fortunate as to quit the ship i showed myself faithful to the last moment of the captain's stay what is there to leave a doubt in the minds of impartial and dispassionate men of my being perfectly innocent happy indeed should i have been if the master had stayed on board which he probably would have done if his reasons for wishing to do so had not been overheard by the man who was in the bread-room captain bligh in his narrative acknowledges that he left some friends on board the bounty and no part of my conduct could have induced him to believe that i ought not to be reckoned of the number indeed from his attention to and very kind treatment of me personally i should have been a monster of depravity to have betrayed him the idea alone is sufficient to disturb a mind where humanity and gratitude have i hope ever been noticed as its characteristic features and yet mr hallett has said that he saw me laugh at a time when heaven knows the conflict in my own mind independent of the captain's situation rendered such a want of decency impossible the charge in its nature is dreadful but i boldly declare notwithstanding an internal conviction of my innocence has enabled me to endure my sufferings for the last sixteen months could i have laid to my heart so heavy an accusation i should not have lived to defend myself from it and this brings to my recollection another part of captain bligh's narrative in which he says i was kept apart from every one and all i could do was by speaking to them in general but my endeavours were of no avail for i was kept securely bound and no one but the guard was suffered to come near me if the captain whose narrative we may suppose to have been a detail of everything which happened could only recollect that he had spoken generally to the people i trust it will hardly be believed that mr hallett without notes at so distant a period as this should be capable of recollecting that he heard him speak to any one in particular and here it may not be improper to observe that at the time to which i allude mr hallett if i am rightly informed could not have been more than fifteen years of age i mean not to impeach his courage but i think if circumstances be considered and an adequate idea of the confused state of the ship can be formed by this court 
it will not appear probable that this young gentleman should have been so perfectly unembarrassed as to have been able to particularize the muscles of a man's countenance even at a considerable distance from him and what is still more extraordinary is that he heard the captain call to me from abaft the mizzen to the platform where i was standing which required an exertion of voice and must have been heard and noticed by all who were present as the captain and christian were at that awful moment the objects of every one's peculiar attention yet he who was standing between us and noticing the transactions of us both could not hear what was said to me it has ever occurred that diffidence is very becoming and of all human attainments a knowledge of ourselves is the most difficult and if in the ordinary course of life it is not an easy matter precisely to account for our own actions how much more difficult and hazardous must it be in new and momentous scenes when the mind is hurried and distressed by conflicting passions to judge of another's conduct and yet here are two young men who after a lapse of near four years in which period one of them like myself has grown from a boy to be a man without hesitation in a matter on which my life is depending undertake to account for some of my actions at a time too when some of the most experienced officers in the ship are not ashamed to acknowledge they were overcome by the confusion which the mutiny occasioned and are incapable of recollecting a number of their own transactions on that day i can only oppose to such open boldness the calm suggestions of reason and would willingly be persuaded that the impression under which this evidence has been given is not in any degree open to suspicion i would be understood at the same time not to mean anything injurious to the character of mr hallett and for mr hayward i ever loved him and must do him the justice to declare that whatever cause i may have to deplore the effect of his evidence or rather his opinion for he has deposed no fact against me yet i am convinced it was given conscientiously and with a tenderness and feeling becoming a man of honour but may they not both be mistaken let it be remembered that their long intimacy with captain bligh in whose distresses they were partakers and whose sufferings were severely felt by them naturally begot an abhorrence towards those whom they thought the authors of their misery might they not forget that the story had been told to them and by first of all believing then constantly thinking of it be persuaded at last it was a fact within the compass of their own knowledge it is the more natural to believe it so from mr hallett's forgetting what the captain said upon the occasion which had he been so collected as he pretends to have been he certainly must have heard mr hayward also it is evident has made a mistake in point of time as to the seeing me with morrison and millward upon the booms for the boatswain and the carpenter in their evidence have said and the concurring testimony of every one supports the fact that the mutiny had taken place and the captain was on deck before they came up and it was not till after that time that the boatswain called morrison and millward out of their hammocks therefore to have seen me at all upon the booms with those two men it must have been long after the time that mr hayward has said it was again mr hayward has said that he could not recollect the day nor even the month when the pandora arrived at otaheite neither did captain edwards recollect when on his return he wrote to the admiralty that michael byrne had surrendered himself as one of the bounty's people but in that letter he reported him as having been apprehended which plainly shows that the memory is fallible to a very great degree and it is a fair conclusion to draw that when the mind is at rest which must have been the case with mr hayward in the pandora and the things of a few months date are difficult to be remembered it is next to impossible in the state which everybody was on board the bounty to remember their particular actions at the distance of three years and a half after they were observed as to the advice he says he gave me to go into the boat i can only say i have a faint recollection of a short conversation with somebody i thought it was mr stewart but be that as it may i think i may take upon me to say it was on deck and not below for on hearing it suggested that i should be deemed guilty if i stayed in the ship i went down directly and in passing mr cole told him in a low tone of voice that i would fetch a few necessaries in a bag and follow him into the boat which at that time i meant to do but was afterwards prevented surely i shall not be deemed criminal that i hesitated at getting into a boat whose gunwale when she left the ship was not quite eight inches above the surface of the water and if in the moment of unexpected trial 
fear and confusion assailed my untaught judgment, and that by remaining in the ship I appeared to deny my commander, it was in appearance only. It was the sin of my head, for I solemnly assure you before God that it was not the vileness of my heart. I was surprised into my error by a mixture of ignorance, apprehension, and the prevalence of example, and, alarmed as I was from my sleep, there was little opportunity and less time for better recollection. The captain, I am persuaded, did not see me during the mutiny, for I retired, as it were, in sorrowful suspense, alternately agitated between hope and fear, not knowing what to do. The dread of being asked by him, or of being ordered by Christian to go into the boat, or, which appeared to me worse than either, of being desired by the latter to join his party, induced me to keep out of the sight of both until I was a second time confined in my berth by Thompson, when the determination I had made was too late to be useful. One instance of my conduct I had nearly forgot, which, with much anxiety and great astonishment, I have heard observed upon and considered as a fault, though I had imagined it blameless, if not laudable. I mean the assistance I gave in hoisting out the launch, which, by a mode of expression of the boatswain's, who says I did it voluntarily, meaning that I did not refuse my assistance when he asked me to give it, the court, I am afraid, has considered it as giving assistance to the mutineers, and not done with a view to help the captain, of which, however, I have no doubt of being able to give a satisfactory explanation in evidence. Observations on matters of opinion I will endeavour to forbear, where they appear to have been formed from the impulse of the moment, but I shall be pardoned for remembering Mr. Hayward's, given I will allow with great deliberation, and after long weighing the question which called for it, which cannot be reckoned of that description. For although he says he rather considered me as a friend to Christian's party, he states that his last words to me were, Peter, go into the boat, which words could not have been addressed to one who was of the party of the mutineers. And I am sure, if the countenance is at all an index to the heart, mine must have betrayed the sorrow and distress he has so accurately described. It were trespassing unnecessarily upon the patience of the court, to be giving a tedious history of what happened in consequence of the mutiny, and how, through one very imprudent step, I was unavoidably led into others. But, amidst all this pilgrimage of distress, I had a conscience, thank heaven, which lulled away the pain of personal difficulties, dangers, and distress. It was this conscious principle which determined me not to hide myself as if guilty. No, I welcomed the arrival of the Pandora at Otaheite, and embraced the earliest opportunity of freely surrendering myself to the captain of that ship. By his order I was chained and punished with incredible severity, though the ship was threatened with instant destruction. When fear and trembling came on every man on board, in vain, for a long time, were my earnest, repeated cries that the galling irons might not, in that moment of a frightening consternation, prevent my hands from being lifted up to heaven for mercy. But though it cannot fail deeply to interest the humanity of this court, and kindle in the breast of every member of it compassion for my sufferings, yet as it is not relative to the point, and as I cannot for a moment believe that it proceeded from any improper motive on the part of Captain Edwards, whose character in the Navy stands high in estimation both as an officer and a man of humanity, but rather that he was actuated in his conduct towards me by the imperious dictates of the laws of the service. I shall, therefore, waive it, and say no more upon the subject. Believe me, again I entreat you will believe me, when, in the name of the tremendous judge of heaven and earth, before whose vindictive majesty I may be destined soon to appear, I now assert my innocence of plotting, abetting, or assisting, either by word or deed, the mutiny for which I am tried. For, young as I am, I am still younger in the school of art and such matured infamy. My parents, but I have only one left, a solitary and mournful mother, who is at home weeping and trembling for the event of this day, thanks to their fostering care, taught me betimes to reverence God, to honor the King, and be obedient to His laws. And at no one time have I resolutely or designedly been an apostate to either. To this honorable court, then, I now commit myself. My character and my life are at your disposal, and as the former is as sacred to me as the latter is precious, the consolation or settled misery of a dear mother and two sisters, 
who mingle their tears together and are all but frantic for my situation pause for your verdict if i am found worthy of life it shall be improved by past experience and especially taught from the serious lesson of what has lately happened but if nothing but death itself can atone for my pitiable indiscretion i bow with submission and all due respect to your impartial decision not with sullen indifference shall i then meditate on my doom as not deserving it no such behavior would be an insult to god and an affront to man and the attentive and candid deportment of my judges in this place requires more becoming manners in me yet if i am found guilty this day they will not construe it i trust as the least disrespect offered to their discernment and opinion if i solemnly declare that my heart will rely with confidence on its own innocence until that awful period when my spirit shall be about to be separated from my body to take its everlasting flight and be ushered into the presence of that unerring judge before whom all hearts are open and from whom no secrets are hid p haywood his witnesses fully established the facts which he assumed in this defence he then delivered to the president a paper of which the following is a copy my lord the court having heard the witnesses i have been enabled to call it will be unnecessary to add anything to their testimony in point of fact or to observe upon it by way of illustration it is i trust sufficient to do away any suspicion which may have fallen upon me and to remove every implication of guilt which while unexplained might by possibility have attached to me it is true i have by the absence of captain bly simpson and tinkler been deprived of the opportunity of laying before the court much that would at least have been grateful to my feelings though i hope not necessary to my defence as the former must have exculpated me from the least disrespect and the two last would have proved past all contradiction that i was unjustly accused i might regret that in their absence i have been arraigned but thank heaven i have been enabled by the very witnesses who were called to criminate me to oppose facts to opinions and give explanation to circumstances of suspicion it has been proved that i was asleep at the time of the mutiny and waked only to confusion and dismay it has been proved it is true that i continued on board the ship but it has been also proved i was detained by force and to this i must add i left the society of those with whom i was for a time obliged to associate as soon as possible and with unbounded satisfaction resigned myself to the captain of the pandora to whom i gave myself up to whom i also delivered my journal footnote twenty five faithfully brought up to the preceding day and to whom i also gave every information in my power i could do no more for at the first time we were at otaheite it was impossible for me watched and suspected as i was to separate from the ship my information to captain edwards was open sincere and unqualified and i had many opportunities given me at different times of repeating it had a track been open to my native country i should have followed it had a vessel arrived earlier i should earlier with the same eagerness have embraced the opportunity for i dreaded not an inquiry in which i foresaw no discredit but providence ordained it otherwise i have been the victim of suspicion and had nearly fallen a sacrifice to misapprehension i have however hitherto surmounted it and it only remains with this court to say if my sufferings have not been equal to my indiscretion the decision will be the voice of honor and to that i must implicitly resign myself p haywood mr morrison's defence sets out by stating that he was waked at daylight by mr cole the boatswain who told him that the ship was taken by christian that he assisted in clearing out the boat at mr cole's desire and says while i was thus employed mr fryer came to me and asked if i had any hand in the mutiny i told him no he then desired me to see who i could find to assist me and try to rescue the ship i told him i feared it was then too late but would do my endeavour when john millward who stood by me and heard what mr fryer said swore he would stand by me if an opportunity offered mr fryer was about to speak again but was prevented by matthew quintal who with a pistol in one hand collared him with the other saying come mr fryer you must go down into your cabin and hauled him away churchill then came and shaking his cutlass at me demanded what mr fryer said 
I told him he only asked me if they were going to have the longboat, upon which Alexander Smith, Adams, who stood on the opposite side of the boat, said, It's a damned lie, Charlie, for I saw him and Millward shake hands when the master spoke to them. Churchill then said to me, I would have you mind how you come on, for I have an eye upon you. Smith, at the same time, called out, Stand to your arms, for they intend to make a rush. This, as it was intended, put the mutineers on their guard, and I found it necessary to be very cautious how I acted. And I heard Captain Bly say to Smith, I did not expect you would be against me, Smith. But I could not hear what answer he made. He says that, while clearing the boat, he heard Christian order Churchill to see that no arms were put into her, to keep Norman, Mackintosh, and Coleman in the ship, and get the officers into the boat as fast as possible, that Mr. Fryer begged permission to stay, but to no purpose. On seeing Mr. Fryer and most of the officers going into the boat, without the least appearance of an effort to rescue the ship, I began to reflect on my own situation, and seeing the situation of the boat, and considering that she was at least a thousand leagues from any friendly settlement, and judging, from what I had seen of the friendly islanders but a few days before, that nothing could be expected from them but to be plundered or killed, and seeing no choice but of one evil, I chose, as I thought the least, to stay in the ship, especially as I considered it as obeying Captain Bly's orders, and depending on his promise to do justice to those who remained. I informed Mr. Cole of my intention, who made me the like promise, taking me by the hand and saying, God bless you, my boy, I will do you justice if ever I reach England. I also informed Mr. Hayward of my intention, and on his dropping a hint to me that he intended to knock Churchill down, I told him I would second him, pointing to some of the friendly island clubs which were sticking in the booms, and saying, There were tools enough. But, he adds, I was suddenly damped to find that he went into the boat without making the attempt he had proposed. He then appeals to the members of the court, as to the alternative they would themselves have taken. A boat alongside, already crowded, those who were in her crying out she would sink, and Captain Bly desiring no more might go in, with a slender stock of provisions. What hope could there be to reach any friendly shore, or withstand the hostile attack of the boisterous elements? The perils those underwent who reached the island of Timor, and whom nothing but the apparent interference of divine providence could have saved, fully justify my fears, and prove beyond a doubt that they rested on a solid foundation. For by staying in the ship, an opportunity might offer of escaping, but by going in the boat nothing but death appeared, either from the lingering torments of hunger and thirst, or from the murderous weapons of cruel savages, or being swallowed up by the deep. I have endeavored, he says, to recall to Mr. Hayward's remembrance a proposal he at one time made, by words, of attacking the mutineers, and of my encouraging him to the attempt, promising to back him. He says he has but a faint recollection of the business, so faint indeed that he cannot recall to his memory the particulars, but owns there was something passed to that effect. Faint, however, as his remembrance is, which for me is the more unfortunate, Ought it not to do away all doubt with respect to the motives by which I was then influenced? And, in conclusion, he says, I beg leave most humbly to remind the members of this honorable court that I did freely, and of my own accord, deliver myself up to Lieutenant Robert Corner of HMS Pandora on the first certain notice of her arrival. William Muspratt's defense Declares his innocence of any participation in the mutiny. Admits he assisted in hoisting out the boat and in putting several articles into her, after which he sat down on the booms, when Millward came and mentioned to him Mr. Fryer's intention to rescue the ship, when he said he would stand by Mr. Fryer as far as he could, and with that intention, and for that purpose only, he took up a musket which one of the people had laid down, and which he quitted the moment he saw Bly's people get into the boat. Solemnly denies the charge of Mr. Purcell against him of handing liquor to the ship's company, Mr. Hayward's evidence, he trusts, must stand so impeached before the court as not to receive the least attention when the lives of so many men are to be affected by it. For, he observes, he swears that Morrison was a mutineer because he assisted in hoisting out the boats, and that Mackintosh was not a mutineer, notwithstanding he was precisely employed on the same business, that he criminated Morrison from the appearance of his countenance, that he had only a faint remembrance of that material and striking circumstance of Morrison's offering to join him to retake the ship, 
that in answer to Musprat's question, respecting Captain Bly's words, My lads, I'll do you justice, he considered them applied to the people in the boat, and not to those in the ship. To the same question put by their court, he said they applied to persons remaining in the ship, and he notices some other instances which he thinks most materially affect Mr. Hayward's credit, and says that if he had been under arms when Hayward swore he was, he humbly submits Mr. Hallett must have seen him, and he concludes with asserting, what indeed was a very general opinion, that the great misfortune attending this unhappy business is that no one ever attempted to rescue the ship, that it might have been done, Thompson being the only sentinel over the arm chest. Michael Byrne's defense was very short. He says, It has pleased the Almighty, among the events of his unsearchable providence, nearly to deprive me of sight, which often puts it out of my power to carry the intentions of my mind into execution. I make no doubt but it appears to this honorable court that on the 28th of April, 1789, my intention was to quit His Majesty's ship Bounty with the officers and men who went away, and that the sorrow I expressed at being detained was real and unfeigned. I do not know whether I may be able to repeat the exact words that were spoken on the occasion, but some said, We must not part with our fiddler, and Charles Churchill threatened to send me to the shades if I attempted to quit the cutter, into which I had gone for the purpose of attending Lieutenant Bly. And, without further trespassing on the time of the court, he submits his case to its judgment and mercy. It is not necessary to notice any parts of the defense made by Coleman, Norman, and Mackintosh, as it is clear, from the whole evidence and from Bly's certificates, that those men were anxious to go in the boat, but were kept in the ship by force. It is equally clear that Ellison, Millward, and Burkett were concerned in every stage of the mutiny, and had little to offer in their defense in exculpation of the crime of which they were accused. On the sixth day, namely, on the 18th of September, 1792, the court met, the prisoners were brought in, audience admitted, when the president, having asked the prisoners if they or any of them had anything more to offer in their defense, the court was cleared and agreed. That the charges had been proved against the said Peter Haywood, James Morrison, Thomas Ellison, Thomas Burkett, John Millward, and William Muspratt, and did adjudge them, and each of them, to suffer death, by being hanged by the neck, on board such of His Majesty's ship or ships of war, and at such time or times, and at such place or places, as the commissioners for executing the office of Lord High Admiral of Great Britain and Ireland, etc., or any three of them, for the time being, should, in writing, under their hands direct. But the court, in consideration of various circumstances, did humbly and most earnestly recommend the said Peter Haywood and James Morrison to His Majesty's mercy, and the court further agreed that the charges had not been proved against the said Charles Norman, Joseph Coleman, Thomas McIntosh, and Michael Byrne, and did adjudge them, and each of them, to be acquitted. The court was then opened, and the audience admitted, and sentence passed accordingly. End of chapter 6, part 2 Recording by Brett Downey